All right, tēnā koutou katoa, no mai hare mai, ko Sophie Sparrow toko inoa, kei ko no, nā moana whakauka ahau e mahi ana, he kai tohu tohu ahau. Hello everybody, thank you all for being here today. My name is Sophie Sparrow, I'm a communications advisor at the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge, uh, and I'll be your facilitator for this webinar today. So a collaborative research project by Fisheries New Zealand and Sustainable Seas has been exploring how mapping and modelling tools can support multi-species finfish management with a case study focused on the Tasman and Golden Bay snapper fishery. The project's recent report on exploring the use of a system diagram and multivariate analysis to understand multi-species complexes in fisheries uh, describes the process that the project has gone through and explores how the various tools can support management of multi-species complexes. This report and its supporting summary documents are available on our website, uh, but we will send out a link to your email after this webinar. So today you're going to be hearing from some of the team behind this research, uh, but before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, so this webinar is being recorded and we will have the recording available on our YouTube channel within the next 24 hours if you'd like to share it around with your colleagues. Uh, our presenters are going to speak for roughly the first half hour uh, and then we'll have plenty of time for a question and answer session. So you can submit your questions using the Q&A function which will be at either the bottom or the top of your screen uh, and I will read out the questions to our presenters so everybody can hear them. Please feel free to pop those questions into the Q&A at any time during the presentation uh, and we'll get to them at the end. So to start us off, we will be hearing from Eric Jorgensen, uh, co-leader of our policy and legislation for EBM project, uh, which aims to develop a research base for policymakers, Māori and stakeholders to navigate the legislation, policy and practice constraints surrounding ecosystem-based management and any changes required to enable it. So over to you, Eric. Kia ora, Sophie. Uh, tēnā koutou. Uh, everybody. Uh, yep. Uh, Sophie, as Sophie said, my name is Eric. Um, and thanks, you all, everybody, for joining us today. Um, just before we dive into our, our brief presentations um, um, from our team, We've got Judy Hewitt, Andrew Allison, Justin Connolly, Jody Milne, Karen Middlemas, and Carol Scott on the panel this morning. Um, there were others involved um, as well who are unable to make it. I'm going to just briefly touch on them through my presentation, but I'll get the team to introduce themselves as, as they go through their section of the presentation. Um, I'm really going to try to keep this uh, brief. I'm not going to try, I'm going to keep this brief this morning. Um, Really my job here today is just to introduce some of the background um, as to how we came about doing this piece of work. Um, then Justin's gonna cover off some of the um, system diagram uh, modeling part of the, or mapping part of the piece. Um, you will find that we will use the term system mapping and system diagrams interchangeably. Um, and I guess that's just a legacy of where we've come from and how the project itself evolved. Um, we apologize, but just be aware that they are the same thing. Um, then we, Judy and Andrew are gonna talk us through the multivariate analysis and agent-based modeling and that um, work that was done to support the, the project. Um, and then we're gonna have Jody and Carol and Karen just talk briefly around their, their um, perspectives of, of the process and some of the outcomes. Uh, so I'll just dive right in, I think, thanks Sophie. Um, thank you. So in the early days, I mean, I guess we're a legislation and policy project overall, but one of our research aim was to look at some of the, the scale aspects of, of management, uh, which you can see on the right hand side of my diagram, research aim two. Um, I'm not sure if you can all read that, I can. Um, to understand and articulate the risk of different management options and scales in the EBM context and create adaptive management options. Um, appropriate to fluid, spatial and temporal scales. So that was a research aim that we in the challenge had. And I guess we, we talked about several case studies, but the one 
we thought might add most pragmatic value um, was looking at what was then the draft National Inshore Finfish Plan and understanding whether we could actually meet our research aim needs and also help progress um, some thinking around how the inshore, the draft inshore and fish plan might evolve. So we actually had two or three meetings in Wellington with Fisheries New Zealand to talk that through. Um, and, and A, would it work? And B, if so, in what area? And, and so we started to narrow in on, on multi-species um, analysis and how we might support that work through socio-ecological models. Um, and then as the discussions evolved, we discovered that um, system diagrams would help progress that. Um, and Justin was brought into the team. Um, and so, yeah, so we dived into it. In short, then, yes, uh, we, could, we could find some ways that we could meet both the objectives of the challenge and Fisheries New Zealand. Um, if you could click over, please, Sophie. Um, in the end, how can we use a collaborative modeling tool um, to improve analysis advice and inform multi-species management. Um, and, and I mean, I'm not gonna read what's on the slide. Um, you can see both aspects of that there. When, as we progress through the process itself, we, um, and got more detailed, particularly as we headed into looking at the uh, multivariant analysis to help support um, defining the agent-based model, we actually refined that um, the question for the ABM model uh, more, which Andrew will cover on, um, to make it more, more specific around part of the map. Because as you'll see, the map is very big and complex. Um, there's some pros and cons around that. So then we dived into some fairly classical, if you could flick over, please, Sophie. I mean, I've just put this in almost, not quite as a filler, but we dived into some fairly typical project planning um, in terms of the what, how, when, who, um, what tools, processes we could apply through what parts, how that might be staged, who would need to be involved. Um, and, and I guess what the reason I put up, this up a, a couple of things are, it was very much our two hono hono processes and wayfinding. You know, we set out, we knew where we wanted to end up, how we could meet our two research aims. We, we knew we had to hit some targets along the way, but we, we also acknowledged that as we learned and found out more as we moved along, we weren't fixated on hitting everything that we said we would at the start. If it made sense to change direction or, or tack, I should use in, the, in a maritime um, analogy, if it made sense to change tack, then we did so. Um, for instance, as, as we progressed, we determined that uh, we had hoped to um, hold some public forums um, to share the, our findings and information and in, indeed get some input in early in the process. But as we progressed, we, we determined that actually this really is more a management tool and there would be no need to do that. There would be little value for the wider public um, or indeed ourselves in, in going through that step. So we changed course a little bit um, as we went along. Um, so shaved the process off. Um, you can see from the list of participants there how, how broad um, are people we engage in our core project team. Um, not everyone was involved all the way through. Um, certainly some of the fisheries New Zealand people helped us shape it and then kept a watching eye on things. Um, yeah, but, but so we, we pulled in people from, of course, Sustainable Seas and Fisheries New Zealand, but also when we did our first, you know, landscape view of things to determine who else should be involved, I mean, as most of you will probably be aware, you know, you need to involve the regional councils, you need to involve the Department of Conservation, you know, industry and in and that in that field were a big player, along with uh, recreational, forest and bird and, and customary knowledge. And I'll finish with customary knowledge because that knowledge, that mataronga, it was really the important thing around getting people and um, determining who should be involved because we weren't looking for a sectoral based approach we were actually looking for people who had skills and knowledge and experience of the area in our focal study, um, the subject of our focal study. So they were, they were the more important things. Um, if we needed to take representative perspectives of these things, you know, that can and will happen if, if management pick up the work and put it out through public consultation and things like that, um, which I think is quite some way down the track. Uh, yeah, uh, progress please, Sophie. 
So now it's just very broadly, as I said, the team will take us through this. Um, but you know, our, our broad process was get everyone in the room. We put together a prospectus, prospectus for the people to look at and engage with and ask questions. Um, and after having re reviewed that, you know, the people came on board. So first thing was, you're not expected to read all of this um, or see it, but first thing was, you know, the big brain dump thing. Um, and so the black are all the subject headings that we started doing brain dumps on. What do we know about our focal area, Tasman Golden Bay? What do we know uh, about the users of that area, the values, the habitat, water temperature, climate change? What are the systems that are managing it? The Resource Management Act, Conservation Act, Quota Management System, the whole thing. And then Justin does some magic and starts to develop our, our system diagrams. Um, and then they review feedback, review feedback um, to our final system diagram. Um, and the colors do mean things. Justin can talk us through that. And from there, we use that foundation piece of work, if you like, the full system diagram map, to start to target where our more detailed analysis might be, um, which, which is where, and you then say, okay, if we want to build an agent-based model, what's the purpose of the model? Um, what are we trying to explore? Because in this case, it's very much an exploration. And what information do we need to feed into that model? And that's where the multivariate analysis comes in. Again, Judy will, will talk us through how we approach that and, and, and what came out of that. Um, so that's the broad process and people will be talking us through that. Um, final slide, please, Sophie. And Sophie's already covered this off. There are four reports in total out of this, this piece of work, uh, three summary reports and then and the full report. Uh, and, and obviously those links will all be provided to you. And that is my part finished. Thank you for listening. Um, and I will hand over to Judy. Thank you. Kia ora Koto, you're actually handing over to me, Justin. <laughs> I'll pretend to be Judy for a moment and channel Judy. Um, I just want to- Aroha mai. No, no, all good. So Kia ora Koto, Justin Connolly is my name. Um, I'm the director of a small uh, consultancy called Deliberate, and that specializes in qualitative research and the use of systems thinking to help understand complexity. So I'm going to talk about that systems thinking part today. Sophie, if I could just get you to pop back one slide for a moment, please. Just wanted to pause briefly and just talk about how we use systems thinking, but just touch on that point Eric made. I refer to system diagrams, but they're often interchangeably referred to as system maps or causal diagrams. Um, they are interchangeable terms and so if there's any confusion there apologies um, but we're trying to understand cause and effect and map out the complexity that way um, I, we've done that via a participatory process and just wanted to highlight as, as Eric's alluded to in the process this was quite a wide look and a synth uh, we attempted to synthesize a bunch of stuff we knew uh, in order to provide a base with which to then build other things on the original plan was to do a system diagram and then build an agent-based modeling model as we progressed through, uh, the multivariate analysis was added in, and that was really valuable. Um, but it was something that came from the process as we evolved. So that wayfaring um, sort of approach that Eric touched on. Thank you. Next slide. Just touching on systems thinking. So at the core, that's about moving from thinking in linear causality to thinking in circular causality. Now, this is probably familiar with many of you on the call, but just wanted to make this point. Both ways of thinking are very valid ways of thinking, um, but we often uh, have a, a very linear way of looking at the world, sort of A leads to B, leads to C, full stop. So that represented by that top diagram. Um, but when we start seeing the world in feedback loops, everything is interconnected and loops back on itself, um, that it, it can provide us a better insight into how things are interconnected systemically and with complexity. So the um, this feedback complexity that we try to build in these system diagrams is, is often quite aggregated but that is intended to complement a lot of the detailed complexity that we have in the other parts of our work and organization with the deep knowledge in certain areas next slide um, so this slide is just showing you a, a, a rough um, overview of all the images that came out of it it's a very visual approach um, and i won't talk through all of these obviously we don't have time but there's plenty of detail in the reports. Uh, the right-hand side there, you'll see a large overview diagram. 
and a couple of smaller ones that focused on specific areas that we wanted to unpack some of that complexity a little bit. Um, next slide. If I hone in on that deep, um, complex one, um, the, the eternal challenge in, in the systems thinking world is to attempt to anchor your diagram around something, if you look, use another marine um, pun. But we've anchored it here around the, the, the life chain, life cycle, basically, of um, any type of fish species. So that's kind of that green chain you see through the middle there. And that provided us the point from which we can explore some of that feedback complexity. And that diagram, um, as I said, is the base for other modeling. The, the multivariate analysis and the agent-based modeling, it should be noted, are only a subset of what we see in that diagram. So that broad versus that detail and how they complement. But they, they also to highlight, there's two good ways, of um, two easy ways that we've used this in the diagram. So that um, in terms of an output, the process itself, I should stress, is really useful in terms of bringing people together and others will talk about their experience soon. But if I first go next slide, please, Sophie, the first way that we can get insight from this is to, once we have built that diagram, highlight who's responsible for what. So these light blue areas have been highlighted from a Fisheries New Zealand perspective where they have influence or direct responsibility. And immediately that starts to highlight that they're only in charge of a subset of the map. Next slide. And the other way, is to, whilst it is a qualitative process, we can infer from looking at some of the feedback loops, some of the dynamics we might expect to see uh, in the system that we have mapped out. And here's a range that we talk about in the report. I won't talk through these in detail, but just to highlight that there are a range of dynamics that we might see over time based on the interactions that we have mapped out. Next slide. So pretty much at the end of my time. So I'll just pause there and refer you to the report that outlines all of this. Um, and there's a link there for when these slides are circulated later, but they're on the Sustainable Seas website. And I will now hand over to Judy. Right, okay. So multivariate analysis is, um, it's been long, used for a long time in ecology and, and what it's really there for, it's a way to visualize lots and lots of different variables that have been collected at lots of, different places or for different species or for different purposes. And that's really all it is. There's, there's two major types. One is the kind of the tree diagram, which is basically looking at clustering things together depending on how similar or different they are. And the other is the actual um, 2D flat map, although you can have 3D ones as well, where you just see how close things are together and that means that they're more similar. Um, so why did we actually bring this in? Uh, next slide, please, Sophie. That's complicated, and that's just for one species. Next slide, Sophie. Even if we focus in on a small portion of it, that's complicated when we start suddenly start looking at six different species. So really, the, the MVA was about actually how do we highlight where differences and similarities between species might impact on managing them as a complex um, this might be species using different habitats, reacting differently to non-fishing stresses, or even being caught differently by different fishing methods. But what I'm going to do at the moment is show how we can use that, but I'm going to just deal with the biological components as an example. Next one, please, Sophie. So um, start with you've got to have information. <laughs> So we've got a large number of biological components out there. These are just, just some of them. And so we went out there and we tried to gather information on all of these different things. Next one, please. So you might end up with this sort of data. Uh, we know that John Dory are predatory on other species adults. Uh, we know that they eat squid, crabs, mollusks, and kina. And we know that rig eat invertebrates, and we're not quite sure whether or not they're predators on any of the other ones. So we have this sort of data table that has information that we know and information that we don't know. Um, and if you move on to the next one. Um, once, we, once we've got and, and highlighted down on the stuff that we do know, that we actually have information on, we can actually then look at um, changing those, those flat yeses and flat noes and maybe here and maybe there into some form of um, probability of something happening. So um, 
the 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 Gurnard, for example, um, are found around erect three-dimensional structures, but also at some stages in their life, particularly when they're juveniles, they'll just be swimming in the water column, that sort of thing. Um, the, the depth range, adult depth range is particularly typical, kind of they um, often, they'll either be found in shallow areas or they'll be found in, in slightly deeper areas, but we didn't actually have any that was saying that they were particularly found uh, below 200 metres. Um, and it's, it's probabilistic that allows us to kind of keep track of the ones that we're not sure about. So 50-50, um, not really quite sure about that. But it does mean that we actually also have to take out stuff that we don't have any information on. So for a lot of the species, we had no information on their preferred temperature ranges, the um, velocities that they liked, whether or not they liked highly productive areas, um, things like that. So go on to the next one. So then we stick this matrix into the, the multivariate analysis that we've chosen, and it magically tells us this sort of thing, how similar things are to each other. So obviously, John Dory is 100% similar to itself. That's the line going down that way. Um, but it has a 78% um, similarity with, um, with Snapper for this particular um, component that we're looking at. Uh, next slide, please. And we can see this, for example, for the adult and juvenile habitats, what they actually, where they actually like to be. And um, hit return just briefly, please. Okay. So um, you have these different similarities and you can basically cut those off at any points that you like. Um, here we've done it at a 60% thing and we can see that rig and flatfish are more similar to each other than they are to the Terraki, than they are to the Ren Gurner John Dory Snapper. That's what you get out of this sort of thing. So how do we then kind of like, you could say, well, we've got all these things on different bits and how do we actually put it on the systems map? Um, so Justin had a brilliant idea for this. Next slide, please. So what we did was, um, firstly, we've got the number of clusters. So obviously, um, if we only have one cluster, we know everything about it and they all come out pretty much the same. They, they, they're, they're really closely together and how they're responding to that particular component. Um, the, we might also not have any information for one. So the first one, we've got no information. We've got information for five species. We've only got one cluster. So we've color coded in that way. Um, the next one, we had information available for three species, three had no information, but there were three clusters. So they didn't actually have commonality together. So going through that, if you go to the next one, we can overlay that on the map. So you can see areas that we're fairly certain that the components um, are fairly similar to each other and they won't kind of impact too much on managing as a complex, and also ones that we're highly uncertain because there are lots of missing information. So really the, um, the thing is all about actually um, trying, as I said, both to understand what information we have, what information we don't have, and how similar the species may be for a particular component, and thus how useful managing them as a complex might be. Move on. And I think that's over to Andrew. Thanks, Judy. <clears throat> so hi, everyone. Um, I'm Andrew Allison. I'm a coastal adaptation scientist at NIWA. So I'm not a fisheries scientist, but I do have a background of doing a lot of agent-based modeling over the last decade or so, which is why Judy and others brought me into this project to help out in that area. So I'm going to cover this very briefly as time's constrained, but I'll quickly go through the scoping process that we went through, model development, and some results. Next slide, please. So the system diagramming exercise that Justin led uh, were a way of eliciting the causal assumptions about the system and the ideas that everyone in the room has about the system. So, you know, what that system looks like, what it does, how different parts of it interact, and how it operates. And Judy's multivariate analysis then quantifies those relationships as best we can. And then the agent-based modeling part of the project it's a quantitative tool to test the accuracy of some of these assumptions. So to understand how the systems and the variables interact in the real world, 
And as everyone said, this is a very complex system. So we took two small portions of the systems map uh, and the MVA to turn into an agent-based model. So next slide, please. So this is the research question that we developed. And as Eric mentioned, it's different from the overall project research question. Uh, and then we developed the model to answer this question. So that was an iterative process. We went through four stages for memory of question development before we settled on this question. Uh, it needed to have both spatial and temporal components because that's one of the strengths of agent-based modeling. And that meant not being a solely economics focused question, but it did need to include economics as that was obviously of interest to the industry and Fisheries New Zealand, our partner in this work. So that's the question there up on screen. Uh, how might a change in TACC of one in the end, primary stock impact on the multi-species complex and commercial viability? And what would happen if that change happens at different times within the abundant cycles of different species? And we focused on snapper for this model, but it included all of those six species that you've seen in the previous slides. And then we had to develop an economic return measure to be able to measure commercial viability. Uh, the one we used in this case was seasonal catch minus the cost of ACE, that's the annual catch entitlement. Uh, it's a very simple metric and it provides a metric for whether a fish's return is economically viable. And it simply assumes that all costs uh, fluctuate based on fishing effort, which is broadly true. If TACC is changed in a relatively timely manner, then the operational costs of catch should be relatively stable as they're largely driven by effort. So more effort equals more costs. But we do know that that's a simple metric and it does miss some of the nuance in the system. For example, last year when petrol prices and diesel prices went through the roof, there were some fishers who were staying home and not actually putting out to sea to get boats, uh, sorry, to catch fish because of the cost of diesel having tripled over the last year. Uh, but nevertheless, this is that, that's the metric that we worked off. Uh, next slide, please. So we tested four types of uh, changes to TACC over time. There was a one-off increase, an incremental increase, an incremental decrease, a one-off decrease, and a stable TACC with no changes. All the changes that either increased or decreased uh, were a total of a 25% change in TACC over a 20-year period or instantly in the case of a one-off increase. Uh, next slide, please. So we did a Monte Carlo analysis. Uh, broadly speaking, that's running the model hundreds and thousands of times to be able to get the full distribution of system behavior and understand how the system uh, works uh, and all the possible types of behavior it can exhibit. So in all the different situations, uh, stock abundance and uh, economic performance of fishes differed between the five scenarios, both in the years 2050 and 2080, which is the two uh, years that we were looking at. So in both 2050 and 2080, Incremental and one-off decreases in TACC both led to marginally higher stock abundance in the complex and a greater percentage of fishers making profit when compared to a stable TACC. And vice versa, increases in TACC led to lower stock abundance in the complex and a smaller percentage of fishers making profit. These differences were numerically small, but they were statistically significant. So the model was suggesting a clear direction of change in those response variables driven by a change in TACC. Uh, for the second part of the research question, this model was unable to determine the influence of the timing of the change in TACC on the multi-species complex and commercial viability. That's definitely not to say that those are unimportant. Uh, it's just that in a simple model, and as we've seen, we've taken a small portion of the systems map and developed the model out of it, the changes in that were obscured by the natural variability in the system. Uh, next page, please. So our research team had two objectives for the ABM part of the process. It was to explore the process of scoping and developing an agent-based model in and for a fisheries context, and to demonstrate the potential utility of ABM to help inform EBM, ecosystem-based management, in fisheries. So as we've all covered here, there's a report on this and there's links on the webinar's webpage to Justin's system diagram report, the MVA report, and the overall summary report for the whole project, as well as the agent-based modeling report. Uh, but basically, to answer the questions quickly, uh, for point one, all participants highlighted that the model scoping and development process was, I quote, enlightening and non-confrontational. That's not my quote, that's someone else's. Uh, contributing to model focus, seeing the model in a prototype form, providing feedback, and then seeing the model in final form was, uh, we were told, valuable and facilitated a greater understanding of the model and the system than just simply being presented with numerical outputs in a model at the end of the process. So being able to observe the model running and having the ability to ask questions and provide feedback for the research participants shows how an agent-based model 
can be used to improve stakeholder engagement in a fisheries process. And for objective two, again, it's covered in detail in the report, but basically the write up there considers how the workshop series discussions, development of an economics performance metric and exploring the impact of that performance metric on fisher behavior and the multi-species complex shows the potential of agent-based modeling to raise questions about our understanding of these complex systems and to provide suggestions on how those may be answered. So some of the uh, questions that were raised, I've suggested would be better answered by other types of modeling than agent-based modeling. There's a lot of types of modeling out there as you're all aware. Basically going through this process demonstrated the potential utility of agent-based modeling to inform ecosystem-based management and fisheries in the future. And uh, I will now pass on to Jody, I believe. Um, Morena Koto, I'm Jodie Milne from Fisheries New Zealand and um, Sustainable Seas has us, us along with um, our, our fellow participants to provide our perspective on the case study. So um, for those that don't know our region, the photo you're looking at is of um, Tasman Bay at the top of the South Island, Te Te Ihu, and the case study focused on uh, the Bay and also Golden Bay, which um, is quite a big area. Um, with different slide, please, Sophie. Um, for us, we were, um, the project was a really good opportunity for us to try um, explore new ways of thinking and, um, and new novel tools for our fisheries management decisions. Um, we were in the early stages of trying to look at the independencies of fish caught together within our mixtural fishery in the region and we saw this as a great opportunity to to expand our knowledge and look at different ways of um, applying these tools and improving our advice so next to um, next slide please for us um the systems mapping approach was um, was really important to demonstrate the complexity of the inputs and outputs to the marine environment and how they interrelate. Um, for for us as a group, it was really beneficial. Um, we all came from different areas of expertise, so it helped us find some common ground between different sectors and agencies. And um, it also helped us better understand the role and influence of um, different different agencies that manage the marine ocean, um, marine environment. Um, in terms of the multivariant analysis, for me, we found it quite critical for our team. Um, while we were doing the systems mapping, we were really struggling to see how it would re relate in the multi-species aspect. So um, the researchers were great and answered our many, many questions and, um, and progress to, to the multivariant analysis to help inform that thinking. Um, the agent-based model, of course, was great for us to see how you could test different management um, scenarios um, and how pulling different levers might have different short or long-term outcomes. So next slide, please, Sophie. Uh, for us at Fisheries New Zealand, it's still early days and how we incorporate these tools into, into our processes. Um, the, the project was, you know, exploratory. It wasn't intended to produce usable management outputs right now. It was more to demonstrate how these novel tools could help us and, you know, and, and for us to understand how they work essentially. Um, further investment is required um, to fill critical information information gaps that were identified. Um, we acknowledge that we'll never have complete information, but there will be some, there was some quite important gaps in knowledge that we need to explore a bit further. Um, upskilling analysts is also something we need to consider as an agency. Um, the pilot project was was deliberately made generic enough that we could apply it to different, different regions in New Zealand. Um, the team from Fisheries New Zealand that was engaged in this process was spread across the country. So both um, Auckland and in the South Island, but um, for the purpose of making sure different projects were interrelated. And of course, Hauraki Gulf, um, there was case studies going up and just seeing how, how these projects would interrelate with each other. 
Um, and of course, a, a key thing for us is, is how we apply socio-ecological modelling with our quantitative stock assessments. Um, so that's something we're still grappling with. And, and yeah, we hope to keep moving forward to our multi-species multi management as we go forward. So that's it from me. Over to you, Karen. Thanks for that, Jodie. Um, hi everyone, yes, Karen Middlemas from the Department of Conservation. I'm based down in Nelson, so um, in the Tasman Bay area. Um, I came to this team to provide a bit of a lens uh, on uh, looking at improving adverse impacts of fishing on protected species and the marine environment, so sort of representing that side of the table. Um, I have to say that, you know, this process um, I found was hugely valuable. I think everybody understands that an ecosystem is, is the sum of a whole lot of moving parts and you have to have all of the people that re represent those different parts at the table. You have to have um, people that can manage a team of people like that in all those different perspectives in a way that has meaningful outcomes where everyone feels heard and valued for representing their their particular areas and I you know um, Justin did an amazing job in pulling that diagram together looking at all of those different aspects that feed into the ecosystem that we were looking at um, and no one person or even a couple of people could come up with all of that and um, you know and, and the interactions between them all so you know that that was a hugely um, uh, valuable experience and I would suggest to anyone who's considering using this type of model for ecosystems um, based management, uh, definitely consider uh, it as a, as, as a tool. Um, and you know, you could, there's lots of different questions that can be answered with it. I certainly think looking at a regional level, it was really valuable having people on, on the ground in the area that can represent that particular uh, ecosystem. So yeah, it's um, from my perspective was really valuable. And uh, in the networking side of it is Again, another aspect, uh, building those relationships, seeing different points of view, seeing how everybody comes at this from different from a different aspect, but you know, working together to try and come up with, um, you know, the, with a result that suits everybody is important. So thank you. And over to Carol. Morning, everybody. Um, it's fantastic to see so many people online. Um, so Carol, I'm Carol Scott, I manage uh, Southern Inshore Fisheries Management Company, which is a representative organisation um, looking um, after the matters for um, South Island quota owners. Um, also very um, involved with the, uh, working with fishermen as well. Um, again, I'm sort of repeating what um, others have said, how valuable th this was. And from our point of view, it was, it was great to bring to the table, you know, all the aspects of what we deal with and how we're integrated into the, the rest of the, um, well, the environment and the ecosystem and land-based activities and that sort of thing. But it's also, it was also um, a good chance for others to see um, how commercial fisheries actually do um, fit in with, with those aspects as well. Um, you know, we did concentrate on Tasman Bay, Golden Bay snapper fishery, but as we know, that fishery now is down uh, right along the um, west coast. So it'll be interesting to see how we, um, utilise the model and how we may need to adapt it um, as well to go further afield. Uh, when it comes to information gathering, we do have trawl surveys, um, which we may need to look at as well to you know, optimise the information we get off that to, to hopefully, can we use, use those to fill the gaps that we've identified you know, as an outcome of this work as well. Um, we also got in the last couple of years, the Moana project that has been collecting water temperatures. So again, another data set that we need to sort of maybe try and integrate into the loop. But anyway, I'll, I'll finish up now. We've got a, a eaten into our um, Q&A, but yeah, it was a really good exercise. And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how we're gonna use it for management. Kia ora, Carol. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, so we do have time now for questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please pop those into the Q&A box. Uh, we've got a couple that have come through already from Rebecca Alexander. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, so the first question we have got, how has the science or model considered one-off major effects on fisheries? For example, cyclones, earthquakes, other terrestrial impacts? I can jump in and start answering that one straight away and then perhaps um... Andrew, you might like to comment as well. 
give you a bit of warning. <laughs> I um, So there's a couple of comments I would make here. So in terms of the system diagram, um, things like, you know, sediment load or those sorts of things are, are factors. And, and the way that that is built up is it's it's literally kind of a long approach of more or less of this will lead to more or less of something else. That's what those nodes and arrows are. Um, so there is one of those diagram, um, one of the little graphs, sorry, that I showed the quick slide of, is one actually around terrestrial impacts, I think, of storm events and major sediment wash. So you view each of those variables in that diagram as some kind of trend over time. So if you have a, a peak of perhaps a, a slug of sediment or whatever it might be, you might have one for a short period of time and then it goes back down. But you can, it can help you conceptualise the flow on and legacy impact of that. And one of those graphs is then the you know benthic mass might increase but stay quite solid because it's not washing away. So that's the answer to the first part. The second part is a of your question um, around the whole the, how will the science or model work with climate change and seeing our snapper move further south. Uh, the di the system diagram itself is less um, suitable for that. So the system diagrams just to stress, I didn't make this point explicitly, but I'll make it now, are not spatial um, diagrams or maps, hence partly why I'm trying to encourage us all to avoid using the word map. <laughs> so they often get confused for a geographic or a spatial map, and they're, they're not. They're a conceptual map or diagram of causality. Um, so there are causes and nodes in there relating to, you know, the appropriateness of temperature, for instance, um, you know, which feed into the ability to breed and reproduce. Um, so in that way, it's captured, but not sp particularly specifically spatially. And perhaps I'll hand over there to Andrew, as I'm not sure if you had a comment on the spatial component of that question. Yeah, I did. Thanks, Justin. Um, so we did have to take into account spatial and temporal scales, both in the system diagramming and the modelling. Uh, the agent-based model ended up looking at Tasman and Golden Bay specifically, as that was the scope of our project. Those are part of FMA7, but as Carol mentioned, they're not the entirety of FMA7. That goes partially down the west coast of the South Island. It's far larger than just the bays. So the model that we developed, we knew it was going to be constrained. It was an exploratory tool rather than a... Uh, so it was proof of, proof of concept for fisheries management and how these tools can be used potentially. But we knew it had limitations. Uh, one of those is that we didn't have water temperature, climate change impacts in there, which we know is going to have a big difference because we've seen marine heat waves over the last several years. Uh, it doesn't include climate change, but it does include movement of fish stocks in and out of the area modelled, because as we know, these are lines that people draw on a map. They don't necessarily relate to where the fish go and how they live in their life cycles. So there was a proxy in there that fish stocks were able to move in and out of the model. But as I say, this is not a stock assessment tool. This is purely for testing the effects of different policy levers uh, on the multi-species complex. So to investigate things like if we were to have a change in TAC for one stock, that's the snapper, would there be flow on effects? Would that affect the levels of other stocks in the complex? Uh, the whole process is designed to raise questions. So if there was a then flow on effect for the other species in the multi-species complex, then we'd have some learnings that we'd need to consider all the species in the complex when making management decisions for snapper. Those are the kind of questions we're asking. But no, basically climate change is not included in the model and it's a, it's a yeah, noted hold. Uh, can I add to that? Um, when you're actually managing a, a, a multiple species as a complex, um, the difference in their responses to these things that you're talking about, the terrestrial sediment inputs or the climate change, does actually really become really important. So um, that's kind of one of the, the things that the MVA can be used for to highlight. I mean, when you've only got six species, you can probably figure it out for yourself that, yeah, okay, terrestrial input is going to have more an effect on this species than it is on that species. And the climate change is going to affect that species more. But when you've got a, a large number of species, it becomes a little bit more complex and you can actually gain some idea about which species are most likely to be affected as a group. Um, than other species. Great, thank you all. Uh, we've got another question that's come through from Siana. Uh, she says, thank you for your presentations. 
Uh, the focus of this research is moving towards ecosystem management, uh, but she didn't hear any presenters address the forms of fishing that are destructive to ecosystems, for example, bottom trawling. Bottom trawling can affect benthic habitats and there's more research about its climate impacts. Uh, do the presenters and stakeholders have any desire to see a reduction of destruction fishing methods within that study area? I can lead in a response with this one as well, if you like. Um, so this is a re really important question and, and definitely came up in the discussions that we that we use. So the, the thing I want to stress about the system diagram is that it is a qualitative and conceptual diagram. One of the things that came out of that, the, the well, sorry, one of the things going into it was not the intent to weight any particular influence, but to understand what those range of influences were. So that was what we did with the system diagram. Um, when we had the discussion around the modification of the benthic area or the seafloor, we, we, we framed it in um, uh, non, non specific terms. The, the word is escaping me, sorry, agnostic terms, the word I was looking for. So we talked about um, uh, benthic modification, and there's a range of things that contribute to that. Um, fishing practices is one of them, um, the, you know, mining, cabling, other sorts of things, which might be more applicable in some places than in others. So it sets a ground which can lead to a discussion around how big an impact that is, but we didn't directly answer that question um, in this research with the system diagram. So that's my comment. Does anybody else want to comment on that? I would say that about the only connection that we didn't actually have in there, and I could be wrong about this, but I don't think we actually had a connection between the fishing um, practices and climate change itself. But we certainly had the connection between the, the fishing practices, the habitat, uh, the bycatch, and those sorts of things. But I don't think we had that, that link back up to the, the climate change. Kia ora. Thanks, Justin and Judy. Sorry, go ahead, Eric. No, I'm happy not to speak. Um, yeah, I, I think just, I mean, the, I understand that many people have similar concerns that Fiona's just shared and, and we're losing your audio a bit, Eric. Uh, I'll, I'll just be quiet then. <laughs> Cheers. All right, we've got a couple more minutes. Uh, if there are any final questions, did we have any further points or questions from the panelists that you wanted to discuss? No? Okay. All right, I'll just wait another minute just to see if any other questions are going to pop through. I could add a reflection while we're waiting for more questions. Thanks, Katie. Um, so I guess one of the challenges that I think we'll all acknowledge from the project is um, is not being representative of our sectors. So, you know, we came with the, the basis that we would come with our knowledge and our experience. And, and we, even with the best of intentions, we all naturally fall back to what we're familiar with, which quite often is advocating for, you know, for a sector or, or around our knowledge base. And um, so that was one of our biggest challenges. And, and we all, you know, we all consciously made the effort to try and change that for this project. Um, and I think that has real broad implications across a lot of the complexities we all deal with in the marine environment, so. I might, I might just carry on that reflection, Jody. Thank you for that. The, 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 to me, that just highlights the a, a point I was um, making earlier around the output from the system diagram process is the diagram itself. But the one of the outcomes of the process is the, the the dynamics of the group in terms of how people you know might have evolved their understanding or perception as well. So there's two kind of outcomes effectively from that, which is what I, I, I sensed you touching on there. 
and um, hopefully that process helped uh, you know take the um, adversariality perhaps out of some of the positioning in terms of because we were there not to apportion blame we were there to map out our understanding of what that collective understanding of influences were Great, thank you both. Uh, we do have a couple of comments in the chat as well. Uh, Tame Tarangi is keen to learn about the alignment of this work with Tai Temu Tai Pari, the sea change plan. Uh, is anyone able to comment on that? Um, I could do a little in that it is intended that the, um, that the work from this um, particular project um, feeds quite closely into work that's being done in another sustainable seas project in the Hauraki Gulf, which is looking at the potential indicators to be used in the Hauraki Gulf uh, from, the, from the fisheries perspective, although they have separated that up into three different components, one of which is actually more ecosystem based, one of which is fisheries based and the other which is um, cultural te o Māori based. So the idea originally was that um, the components that got put into the, the diagram, if you insist, Justin, um, to would kind of like be used to highlight particular indicators that 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 flow through to a lot of other things and therefore would be really useful. Um, but that project's only really just started. It's really only just getting going. So we don't know how useful it will be and we don't really know how much it will be picked up. And yes, um, we do know the papers. It's just that I, I don't quite know why we didn't put that link from, from the um, fishing activity into the um, climate change thing. I, I guess... The paper originally, the, those original papers came out after we'd actually started, and I guess we never kind of got back to revisiting that connection. So just always be aware when you look at a systems diagram that it doesn't hold the full truth. <laughs> Question yeah. which bits are missing. Yeah, I'll, I'll just pick up on that very briefly as well, Judy. I mean, oh, there is no one system <laughs> for the whole world, right? And so whenever we're trying to look at things, complexity, through a view of systemic um, thinking or, or, or system dynamics as this is based on. You're always looking at it from a from a point of view or around an anchor. Again, my marine metaphor, if you'll excuse it. Um, and so we took it a particular one. There's absolutely a feedback loop um, around any kind of human activity with emissions and climate change. Um, although for the purpose of what we were seeking to understand in this, the relative impact of that was, was probably uh, not big enough for us to warrant including it. So we've sort of focused it elsewhere. Um, that's yeah that's just the comment I would add um, and if I may just pick up on Shana's follow-up point there as well to her question so in terms of just asking specifically for yes no's around destructive um, methods that my, my answer to that would would be we, we, well certainly I'm not going in with any kind of answer as to what that might be we're not there to blame I personally I'd absolutely like to see less damage done however that happens and the system diagram took an approach that highlighted a range of ways in which um, damage can occur to the ecosystem, the wider ecosystem, including terrestrial and marine stuff. So there's still a conversation to be had around what some of those you know, relative components might be. Um, so to an attempt to more directly answer your question there, hopefully that helps. All right, thank you all. Now, in interest of making sure we finish up on time, I think we'll probably call it there. Uh, no one has any last minute remarks? No, looks good. All right, well, thank you all for joining us. A big thank you to our presenters today for sharing their research. Uh, this recording will be available online and I will send out a link to you all uh, to this and to the reports as well. You'll see that in your inbox in the next 24 hours. Otherwise, have a lovely day. Kakiti anō.